Okay, we're here with Emma Twig, next Olympics, uh, Paris 2024. Emma, why is it important to you to try and defend your Tokyo gold medal? I think there's a lot of um, privilege that comes with being able to call yourself the defending champion. So to be on the start line and be in a position to do that is, is pretty special and it's something that I'm really looking forward to. Obviously there's a lot of water to flow under the bridge before we get to there, but um, that's certainly what's motivating me now. Can you describe for us the moment you went, right, Paris, I'm going to go? Because there's probably been a lot of toing and froing in your mind about that decision. So just describe the moment you went, here we go. Yeah, I think after Tokyo, I was deciding whether I would, would continue to Paris. And at that point, I just said to myself, if you're still enjoying what you're doing, let's take it year by year, day by day, almost. Um, and as time's gone on, that, that time to Paris has become less and less and now we're, we're staring down the, the barrel of 15 to 18 months and for me that's extremely achievable and I feel like I'm, I'm still improving technically, I'm still loving what I do and have a desire to be here and, and part of that also is, is you know, having my family there as well. My, my circumstances at home have changed and to, to be able to have Shara and Tommy there in, in Paris would be something really special um, given that they've never really experienced that with me before. And that's amazing. So you would almost, it's almost a legacy thing for Tommy to see mum, you know, potentially. Yeah, I think that that's certainly part of it. Obviously, you know, there's a whole lot that goes into to coming to that decision. But um, for me, you know, the lifestyle that rowing gives me and the ability to spend more time with him is also really attractive. And whilst my recovery gets absorbed a bit in chasing him around, um, the motivation to, to be successful is, is probably heightened when you've got a little one. Did you write a pros and cons list, or in your mind have a pros and cons list? And if you did, what were some of the considerations that you had to take into account about your decision? Yeah, certainly, you know, there's a, the, a balance of, of scale um, in, in my decision making, and uh, I guess first and foremost, it's about enjoyment and waking up every morning and feeling like I can be better and that I want to be there. Because the moment that that happen, doesn't happen, then then you're not gonna you're not gonna be at the best. Uh, and then part of it has also been the support that Rowan New Zealand has given myself and also some of the other mums in terms of allowing us to take our families and, tra and travel and you know we spend up to three months in Europe every year so it's a pretty big call to say oh, I'm, I'm leaving my family for that time so you know t squaring that away with Rowan New Zealand was, was a really big piece of that puzzle as well. So that is part of the whole thing is that you'll be able to take the family with you? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's something that Rowan New Zealand, I guess, have acknowledged with, with the new mums, that um, there needs to be support there, high performance sport as well, um, which, you know, for a, a family is, is a pretty big deal. It's something that's happened in the past. We've only, we've had dads, I guess, in the programme, and they've been able to bring their, their partners across. But um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's uncharted territory, and I think they've, you know, they've acknowledged that that's a really, really crucial thing. Um, apart from qualifying the boat, what, have you set yourself any benchmarks and what are they for getting to Paris and how you want to perform there? I think when, when we finished in Tokyo, we acknowledged that you couldn't be at the top of your game for the full you know, three years of an Olympic cycle, especially given my age and stage and just the, the mental and physical toll that it, it takes to, to be the best in the world day in, day out for, you know, for that whole Olympic cycle. So after Tokyo, we kind of said, well, you know, take it, take it down a few gears, do a few things that I enjoy doing and um, make sure that there's balance. Uh, and then I guess, you know, my goal is as, as Paris comes nearer, we, we sharpen that pencil and um, you start doing a bit more on the water and, and spending a bit, bit more time down here and, and um, the detail becomes even, even more relevant as the, the peak comes nearer. You know, the joy of winning in Tokyo, I guess what I'm going to ask is, is it an, almost an addictive feeling? Is that part of the reason for Paris? Honestly, I think, you know, Tokyo was, was amazing and, and it was a dream to finally achieve what, I'd, what I've always known that I could do. Um, but I think you very quickly realise that life goes on and, um, you know, whilst it's a huge deal for, for me personally and some of those around me, um, there's, you know, many other things going on in life as well. So I guess that the motivation has to be internal to, to want to keep doing something and, and it has to be something that I you know, love doing um, rather than doing it to, to be successful necessarily or to win more medals and, and prove you know, that, that you're the best. 
So um, yeah, it's 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 probably something that every time I've I've you know achieved a goal, whilst at the time it's really satisfying, um, you know the the perfectionist in me wants to to keep doing the next thing um, and and not sit and reflect so much on what has been. Now I wanted to ask you about being a perfectionist because I was just going to tell you a very quick story and it happened out here, Eric Vadonk, um, as you know, world class and um, Olympic medalist, singles gala, but um, he's well known for one day coming off the water here in a training row and he had a big grin on his face and he said, I finally achieved the perfect stroke and this is when he was 54. I mean. Is there part of you that's chasing that perfect stroke, that perfect row? Yeah, I don't know that you'll ever be, you'll, you'll probably ever acknowledge, and maybe at 54 I will acknowledge that there, there is a perfect stroke, but I think, yeah, right now you're, you're constantly seeking improvement and trying to tweak and, and be better. And I think with that mindset, it's actually hard to say, oh, that was the perfect stroke. So um, maybe that was the secret, Eric's secret. You know, it took him 54 years to, to figure that out. So, yeah, who knows? This is, sort of says a really nice thing about rowing too, doesn't it? In some ways, it, it's a lifetime kind of pursuit. Yeah, totally, and, and you might take the perfect stroke, but there's 360 of those in a race. So the chances of ever doing that, you know, probably fairly slim. Even the number of strokes I've taken in my career to put together the perfect race doesn't happen very often. Uh, can I ask you, all rowers go through this, you know, the moment, you know, you have your training bands and things aren't going so well. How do you lift yourself up when you kind of, if you get to a point where your confidence is a bit low, what, what do you do to bring yourself out of that? Yeah, I think it's something that people experience not just in sport but in life as well. You know, you always go through highs and lows. Um, I can say that in my career the, the people that I have around me are really important in, in helping me navigate those times um, and just reminding me I guess of all the, the positives that there are in life, you know, we you often can focus on the negatives and get, get caught up in those so um, I think a lot of that is, yeah, is mindset and kind of having mechanisms to cope with, with times where things are pretty tough.